Welcome back, everybody. It's week six, and I wanted to check in real quick and remind us that we are about a third of the way through the semester. And as always, if you're struggling with anything, shoot me an email, stop into my open office hours on Zoom every Tuesday morning, or just get a hold of me and we'll set up a one-on-one -on -one at a time that works best for you. Today, I want to talk about the way that changes in our technology affect the way that we participate in politics. Henry Jenkins has been writing about this for a long time. Here's a great quote about how he defines participatory culture in a technology-based society. And right away, you can see that he's painting a very rosy picture for us. He's pointing out all the good things that technology can do and ignoring many of the bad. So before we talk about whether or not he's right, let's talk about how we participate in politics through technology. We currently live in a culture in the US and in much of the world where we never really get out of the technology blogosphere or the constant bombardment of messages meant to sell us things or convince us of the truth. And every time we interact with these messages, we're participating in politics. It might not be obvious when you're doing it, but all of the things we do online construct the reality that people use to decide who they're going to vote for, and ultimately, what laws are created and enforced, what sorts of programs are emphasized and which are ignored. What language is acceptable and what is not, gender norms, expectations, and methods for disciplining and policing behaviors that don't conform. We form connections, communities, social groups, and organizations, and we construct social norms for order in these constructed spaces. We do a lot of politics online nowadays, we just don't really notice that it's politics. Now back to Jenkins' definition. There are two ways to think about technology in the future, and from a human perspective, we tend to be tempted to classify our visions of the future in either one category or the other. We tend to think that either we're all going to live in a Terminator-like world where computers and technology have taken over and are attempting to kill and enslave all humans, or we think that we'll have made it and live in a utopian society where we don't have to sweat or work anymore, where robots fix all of our problems. But that's seldom how it works in real life. Few things are ever strictly good or strictly bad. Part of being human is learning to recognize the potential for both good and bad in almost all things, all systems, and all human beings. So before we move on, I want to talk briefly about something called dialectics or dialectical tension, a big word that sounds a lot more confusing than it actually is. Dialectical tensions are the way that we really think about the world. And Hollywood does a really good job of capturing this and representing it in ways that make it super obvious to the viewer. If you're not familiar with these specific examples, that's okay. You can probably think of books you've read or stories that you've heard or TV shows that you've watched that have these same sorts of characters. They're universal. In all of them, you'll see dialectical tension. It's really difficult to engage with a narrative as a human if there isn't dialectical tension. Tough decisions, selfless acts weighed against easy money, opportunities to do the right thing that are sometimes ignored and other times taken advantage of. Dialectical tensions are what make stories interesting. What drives someone to act? Greed? Lust? Revenge? Love? These are hard to discuss topics that we work through with representations of dialectical tensions. That's why they work so well. Now for the utopian model or ideal of technology and politics. You can think about how the internet provides access to information that would be much more difficult to get a hold of if the internet didn't exist. You used to have to travel to a library or maybe dig through a microfilm file to find old newspaper articles, just as one example. Whereas now many of these things are digitized and accessible from your home office. Technology also makes political communication much more portable. Nowadays, we all have our phones and our video cameras in our pockets, and we can access everything from social media to news to Netflix-style entertainment. The utopian model brags easy creation, at least in theory. You can think about how every year it gets a little bit easier to edit and construct a video or a podcast or a digital file or to update a photo. And nowadays, anybody can make a TikTok. And as a social justice advocate, something I'm always interested in is the way that non-dominant voices or counterpublics can come to have their voices heard and amplified. Technology makes it more difficult for people to suppress those voices so that they are not easily heard by large crowds and their messages can get out by simply clicking on it. 
Nowadays, as long as you have access to the internet and a device, you can click on a blog from anywhere in the world. The dialectical flip side is the dystopian vision, which involves expanding corporate interest in for-profit news networks like CNN or Fox News. These already exist. The net neutrality was something that many of us fought hard for to preserve, but we lost that fight in 2018, so it's now legal for internet providers to sell faster access to companies that can afford to pay for it. And think about how annoyed you get when you go to click on a link and it's loading slowly. Sometimes we just leave and go somewhere else. In the dystopian model, we can also think about the digital divide, which just means that money becomes necessary to get information. Since it's online, if you don't have access to the internet and to a device to navigate that space, you're effectively not going to have access to news, to what's going on. Imagine not having a smartphone nowadays or not having access to the internet for a long time. It'd be really difficult to get any information, to stay up to date at all, or to learn what we need to for education, for school, or how to responsibly interact with the people around us. It also becomes incredibly difficult to weed out exaggerated stories or fake news. And we need education about the technology itself, not just the media that we access with it. In a dystopian model, we can think about confirmation bias, which is more common now than ever. If you take a few minutes to scroll through the pages of some of your defriended friends on social media, you might notice that many of them are taking polls now that we've all deliberately defriended the people that we didn't want to hear from when we took a poll. And what we're doing is constructing an echo chamber, a place where confirmation bias runs amok, where all we have to do is hear confirmations that we've been right all along. So when it comes to methods for upsetting this echo chamber effect, refriending is something we should start to consider. The fact is that when a fake news story pops up on your site, you're much more likely to believe it if it confirms something that you already thought was true. But when we have people around us who disagree with us on politics or religion or ideology or class ideas or the way poverty should be handled in our country, when we keep those people nearby, they speak out rapidly because sometimes they notice things we don't. It might disagree with what they believe and they'll be more likely to be critical of it. And that's what we really want. We want to make sure we're not peddling false information or consuming bad knowledge. The best way to do that is to keep people around us who will force us to self-reflect. 